If you didn't recognize that, that was the prayer of St. Francis. It uh, calls upon us to be the people to bless the world rather than to receive the blessings. Our intention is to bless. And, and some people would call that blessing healing. I've been thinking a lot about healing and curing. This is our theme for the, week, the month of, of, you know, of November is this theme of, of healing. And so, I, you know, as I think about healing and curing, I, I go back to those times when I was a, a psychotherapist before entering ministry. You know, and, and I know those of you who are in the medical field know this, in order to get paid by the insurance companies, you have to use the medical model of diagnosis and treatment, that there is an illness that can be treated, cured, if you will, and then you get compensation for that. I struggled with this model, as did Dr. Lisa Rankin, who you heard earlier. And I, I too, realized that curing means eliminating all evidence of disease, while healing means becoming more whole. And most health conditions, most health conditions, cannot be so easily cured. And especially when you talk about what I was working in mental health. Mental health, oh my gosh, with emotional issues, patterns of behavior, family systems. It was hard to even use that word cure in in that setting. And I do want to talk more about healing the mind, but I'm not going to do that today. Next week, next week, Shay, our, our ministerial intern, and I, we're going to talk about each of our visions of what healing the mind is all about and, and how we as a, a culture, as a people, might address some of that. So I invite you here next week, and we'll be asking you to in, be part of that by bringing your questions and thoughts about healing the mind next week. But the relationship between healing and curing that I've been focused on lately, and that's come into sharper focus for me lately, has to do with our country and what we face right now. I'm wondering about the systemic issues that are tearing us apart as a people, particularly politicizing so many issues, COVID-19, racism, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, indigenous people's rights, even the rights of people to peacefully protest. If you don't know what I'm talking about there, well, check out what our Governor DeSantis is up to in Tallahassee with an anti-mob stand your ground bill. This bill would target people accused, accused of illegal acts during rioting or looting. The bill proposes that physical force, including lethal options, can be used against anyone suspected of illegal acts. Not by police, or not just by police, but by regular citizens. Do you think that will uh, calm down or escalate violence at a rally or a protest in Florida? What will, what can we do about all these issues? Can they be cured? Or are we called to be that healing presence to bless the world? Instead of trying to, to work on issues of COVID-19 or racism or managing peaceful protests, 
as a collective body of fellow citizens through the lens of, of human rights, universal human rights, we, f we seem to have a difficulty in dealing with these issues other than through the lens of politics. It seems we have to be either a Republican or a Democrat and affirm our loyalty to that by choosing how to deal with these human issues, these issues that are all too real for us in this country. I don't want to have to make the choice because I'm a Republican or a Democrat about how I approach issues like COVID-19 or racism or peaceful protests. I don't want to do that. I want to heal the pain in our country that's been caused by this politicizing. But there's also a part of me that wants to cure this problem of politicizing at its core, to eliminate all evidence of it in these issues that we face, these really human issues. When I was living in Iowa, I attended a lecture by two Iowa state legislators. This is an image that you see of the Iowa State Legislature in session. Both had just retired from the legislature and were discussing their experiences. One of them had been a legislator for 20, I don't know, 25 years. The other had just served one term. One Democrat, one Republican. The legislator who had served just one term said something surprising to me. He said that the reason he didn't serve a second term, even though he was doing good work and felt good about what he was doing, was because his party, when he started to, to think about running for a second term, his party told him he would have to say terrible, awful, no good lies about the person he was running against. And he just refused. He said, I'm not going to do that. And so he retired. The other legislator, legislator that had been there for 25 years or so shook his head and said he had been pressured by his party as well to do the same thing. And had always hated that aspect of being in politics. Two very capable legislators doing good work, being pressured by their own party to act unethically just, it was just so hard. It still is so hard for me to understand. Why? Why do we do this? This next image is, is a political ad. Many of us have seen way too many of them recently. Again, exaggerations, lies, trying to make the other person look bad. The vast majority of them. There were some that talked about policies, that talked about agendas, but they were few. Most of the ads I saw day in and day out were designed to shock us so that we would vote for that person, you know, the person whose ad it was, and vote against the person who was, who seemingly was lying or doing terrible things in the world. You know, this season, it was so bad. I just, Martha and I, we just, we would turn the sound off for all the political ads. We just 
couldn't listen to another word. We felt like it was coming into our very souls, all this negativity and hurting us. This is what I think needs to be cured, eradicated. I don't think healing is the answer there. We've got to stop this kind of political discourse. I know radically reconfiguring the way the political season seems to wallow in the gutter would take political will, and I'm, I'm not sure there is such will in, in Washington, D.C., or in any of our states right now. But I know everybody I talk to, everybody is sick of it. And I, I think about that, that first presidential debate between Biden and Trump. And it pushed so many people to the brink of daring. Trump bullying and interrupting and both of them saying unkind things to each other. And you know, I, I was listening to the commentary after it was over on ABC and CNN. And some of the commentators were looking at their phones and they said they'd gotten text from people who, who'd been watching. And the ones, the texts that really impacted them were these texts from their friends and colleagues who were sitting down watching the debate with their children. You see, their children had either been given extra credit by their teachers to watch the debate, or their parents felt like watching the debate was their civic duty, they wanted to teach their children how to be good citizens. But what happened was that these children were traumatized by this debate. What they saw and heard caused them to cry, to go off into their rooms and, and gnash and uh, uh, just weep about our who these people were and what they were doing. What will our children be carrying with them inside after seeing all this? What will they think of what a president should be or a legislator should be? It's so difficult to think about all this. I will tell you, I wonder, is this, this time of COVID, our time of, of healing or curing or both? Do you feel like people in this country, or the country itself needs healing or curing right now? particularly about all this politicizing. You know, I'm going to tell a story at the end of the service today. And, and you know, I'm going to tell you the part of the story now, but you can, you know, hear it later again. But your kids, I want them to hear it as well, to think about it. It's a story about a girl who has a very terrible disease. And this disease made her friends stay away from her. She was, they are afraid of her disease. And so she was lonely as well as sick. And a doctor and a magician and a minister came to visit her in hopes of curing her. The minister uses prayer, the doctor trying to use his laboratory to create a medicine. The magician looking through his books of magic spells. But none of them find a cure. In the end, the girl says that 
even though they didn't find a cure, they gave her what she needed. Love, friendship, company. They helped her heal some of the pain that she was feeling, to manage some of the pain she was feeling. But there's a, a peculiar ending, and I, and I, I wonder about it. And, and when you hear it again later, think about it and think about what it might mean. It says this. The doctor, the minister, and the magician gathered around the little girl and laid their hands upon her. And in the silence that followed, it is said that they found the cure. What do you take away from that ending? You know, as I, I'm thinking about it right now, I wonder, is this time of COVID our time of silence where we might find the cure to all this politicizing? Or maybe how we can begin to cure racism or is this a time for us, a quiet time, for us to put our hands on the problem or the, the sickness, the disease, and make a difference? I am still in a quandary over whether this country needs healing or curing, but in my heart, I'm thinking it's both and right now. It's certainly true that we all need a little healing in our hearts, minds, bodies, souls after what we've been through with the election, with COVID, with so many things. But there are things that need to be cured. And how are we going to go about doing that? How we decide what needs healing and what needs curing and how we go about doing that. Where can we look for answers? I've been thinking about this a lot and, and a couple of friends of mine kind of came to mind as I've been reflecting on all this. Um, the names of my friends are Sadia Covert and Reverend Al Sharp. You'll, you see pictures of them there. Sad, uh, now, she was just recently elected, about a year ago or so, uh, to the DuPage County Board. Before that, she was a, a lawyer um, and in Naperville and a member of a suburban mosque outside of Chicago. Her mosque was attacked a few years ago, and when it was attacked, she began to wonder about how the law in Illinois dealt with hate crimes. Because it didn't seem to do much to help her mosque. And hers wasn't the only faith community, uh, faith building that was attacked in Chicago. I mean, there have been others. There was one on February 2017, a man slapped. Uh, broke into a Chicago Loop synagogue and placed swatch stickers around. And after it was vandalized, people around South Suburban and Central Illinois communities discovered Ku Klux Klan recruitment flyers on their doorsteps. What happened to her mosque was not unique. But after it happened, she made it her mission to craft and get passed a new hate crime bill for Illinois. The bill she crafted had specific consequences for hate crimes, and the new law made it much easier for police and the courts to understand just exactly what constituted a hate crime. See, those weren't in the bill that was the law in Illinois at the time. 
the, the, the lawyers didn't understand it, the judges didn't understand it, the police didn't really understand it. And the consequences given, ah, they varied. But she was able to accomplish this. She got this bill passed with the help of many allies across the political spectrum. And I say that again, across the political spectrum. People, citizens, legislators. And it's now the law in Illinois. And Reverend Sharp. Reverend Sharp has been working literally all over the country. He just recently called me about doing work here in Florida for legal medical cannabis and to get cannabis laws passed that also dealt with the social justice repercussions of those laws. Last year, by talking to both Democrats and Republicans in the state of Illinois, and with the work of many other allies, he worked to get a law passed that legalized cannabis use but more importantly, the social justice components were included in that law. This was a first ever in the country. And it resulted in 770,000 individuals with cannabis records to qualify to have their criminal histories removed. And this bill included an increase in money for social development, and economic development in areas that had been disproportionately affected by the high rates of arrest, conviction, and incarceration related to cannabis-related offenses. I bring up Al and Sadia because any one of us, and I say that again, any one of us could do what they did with allies and motivation, allies from both political parties. Did they achieve cures? Well, to me, it certainly seems that what they accomplished was more than healing. It feels like it's moving us toward eradica eradication, eradication of the problem. Healing includes more heartfelt, ongoing actions to treat the effects of a disease. Curing is taking that direct action to make change happen. To make change happen. Have you, you heard of the, the myth of the babies and the river? The people in some unknown town Next to some river, saw babies floating down the river. You can see the picture there of the people swimming out to get the babies in the river. And they set up programs to feed, clothe, and care for the babies. And they kept doing this and doing this and doing this until finally one person asked, where are all the babies coming from? Healing is about taking care of the babies. And we'll need to continue to do that. Curing is about going upriver and dealing with what is causing all the babies to be put in the river in the first place. To me, curing is about changing the systems that underlie and support the problems. Racism is a good example of this. What are the systems and laws that support racism and white supremacy? If we want a cure, we need to deal with the effects, not only the effects, but the causes. Again, I ask, I wonder, I wonder, do we wait until we emerge from COVID-19 to try and change the culture, the systems, the structures? 
Or do we try to cure some of these problems now? So that we emerge into a new culture, a new country, a new way of being together. Earlier this year, members of UU Miami Social Justice Committee decided to work on the recent election. And we did that. Many members did phone banking, poll watching, ballot curing. Oh, there's that word, curing, again. <laughs> We even put on a concert during the pandemic, during quarantine, to support these efforts. This was amazing. We did not wait until COVID was over to do this work. We could have, people have. But now the election is over. It's time for us to consider our next priority. Do we do healing? Do we curing, do we do curing, or we do both? Both and. That's what Unitarian Universalists are generally called to do, both and. Perhaps we would work on some particular structure and fight racism. Perhaps we would try to fight hate crimes, looking at the laws that deal with hate crimes, or cannabis, or maybe um, we would go down to Tallahassee and lobby against, or, or somehow talk with our legislators, do something to stop this anti-mob stand your ground gun bill, or maybe work on gun violence, some aspect of it that we could heal or cure, some aspect of climate change. And it's, climate change is so important in, this, in Florida. And people always make it the, the second issue of choice. I haven't announced this yet, but I'm going to announce it here, and I'm going to send you an email. The Social Justice Committee needs to meet, so we're going to meet next week, 12.30, next Sunday, November 22nd, right after the service. I invite you, if you feel called to heal or cure, to lobby or protest, to work for equity and justice, please join us. You're all welcome, everybody. The Zoom link registration will be on the UU Miami dot org webpage. You can go there. It's the same one we're going to be, we've been using for our after church discussion, coffee hour. Just join us. Help us decide about the next issue where we will make a difference. One of our forebears, Unitarian Reverend Theodore Parker, in the, 18, in the, in the late 19th century, wrote this, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is long, but from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. And in the mid 20th century, Unitarian Universalist Reverend Richard Gilbert reminded us that this bending toward justice is not automatic nor is it inexorable. It is dependent on people who feel compassion, equity, and justice as imperatives of their faith. And how do we live that? Unitarian Universalist Reverend Tom Owen Toll says this. This is how. When we feel compassion, equity, and justice are imperatives in our faith life, we need to keep the pressure on, we must remain attentive, we must dialogue and dance, meditate and march, we must repent and resist. We must risk more passion and quit trying to be so damn logical about injustice. 
speaking to us, Unitarians, Universalists. My friends, together we can, together we will, with a little more passion, and without trying to be so damn logical, help to keep the moral arc bent toward justice, for that is what we do. Join me as we decide what direction to go to make a difference.